A leader has to take the risks. I mean, what was it like growing up in Russia, though? You know, it's interesting. I always get this question. Um, to me, it was it was great because I got to experience a little bit of the Soviet Union, and it's completely different mentality from what we have right now in the Western world. Um, it was a little bit closer community and um, less competition and a little bit more support. Granted, that system didn't work out, but I got a chance to experience that. So we had a lot of um, events for children uh, to, I don't know, clean the neighborhood together or like participate in certain things. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, I had the childhood. <laughs> to experience <laughs> both kinds of world. And and so what made you want to come live here? So um, I started traveling outside of uh, Russia uh, in my early teens with my family. And when I first time arrived to the United States, to me, that felt like home. I don't know if you ever experienced it or other people experienced that, but certain places you come and you visit and they, they just feel right so that's how i felt about the united states and back then i was a little bit too young to immigrate but in my mind i kind of already knew that would be my home so whenever i had an opportunity after you know getting a little bit older i i moved and, and I how, lived and how old were you when you moved here 21 21 okay so so this was so you you had a full childhood in Russia, what, what did your parents do for a living? My mother is an accountant and my father, he had a few businesses at, at some point and he had like a brick uh, factory and then he was managing distressed assets for companies. So when co companies closing down, he was the person who would come in and rearrange all of the assets and help them go ban bankrupt, I guess. <laughs> so he had a few businesses, but um, uh, they're both retired right now. Did you grow up rich or poor or how was your how was your financials well, was, growing up? I want to say I was in the middle. I've never been very rich. I've never been poor. But, uh, you know, uh, I, it was it was like an average family. And and so but do now your parents, do they still live in Russia or did they come with you? They do. They do. I um, all of my family is in Russia. I have a little sister, well, little, she's study right now. She has a family in Russia and both of my parents, uh, they live between St. Petersburg and Sochi. So Sochi is like a Russian version of California. They have a little bit milder climate. It's very similar to, to our weather, maybe a little bit colder, but you know, after this year, I think it's been cold <laughs> in California too. So we kind of like in Sochi here. And so how do you perceive the the ongoing conflicts right now between Russia and the West? And like, what are people saying over there? And what do your parents say? I mean, what is, you know, how, how do you perceive that? So everything that's going on? So I think conflicts are always wrong. Uh, war is always heartbreaking. I feel like on both sides, there is a lot of brainwashing. And that's the only way to lead a war, because if everybody, you know, did some sort of heart opening ceremonies, everybody would just hug and nobody would go to war. Right. So what you have to do, you have to portray the, the opposite side as a, as a villain, as a uh, country that's a terrorist that is, you know, um, OK with killing babies and, you know, uh, torturing women. And that's what creates the rage. And that's why people are okay going to war. And once they're exposed to that kind of violence, then they want to continue. Because if, if your friend is, has died and uh, you couldn't do anything to help him, obviously you're going to feel this rage. So when, uh, when it comes to politics, I say that we don't have enough data to make, to conclude. If I were a politician, I would probably tell you more, but, um, to me, I wish I knew what was re what's really going on. I, I mean, I think it really just comes down to propaganda, right? I mean, just like you were saying, I mean, you, you have each side, they're going to 
you know, raise as much, they're, they're going to give as much propaganda as they possibly can to make their side right and the exactly. other song, exactly. uh, the other side wrong. And so, exactly. uh, but there's no question. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's just too much uh, uncertainty right now in the marketplace, in, in the world today, in the world place today, because, I mean, let, let's be honest. I mean, you know, when we're dealing with Russia with more nuclear bombs than any other country, and we're dealing with, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, just tons of lots of money, lots of oil, lots of business, lots of lots of people that gain from war. I mean, people make money well, in exactly. war. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so, so, so of course, of there's, a, there's a benefit to go, go ahead, go ahead. When there are a lot of resources that are involved, again, a lot of money, a lot of oil, uh, then uh, when the stakes are so high that the, the rules change, you know, so we really don't know what's going on. I hope it, it's over soon so regular people don't die. And I know everybody is against war because as humans, we, we're we heartbroken, right? When we, when it, when his story like this, but um, ultimately, yeah, I, I hope it's I hope it's over soon. But but ha has it really affected your family there though? I mean, are, are they are they enduring any sort of hardships because of the conflict? No, I think um, I mean there are sanctions in Russia, so that affects like a lot of uh, uh, companies left Russia. So for example, there are no luxury stores right now. Uh, like you cannot buy Chanel in Russia, you cannot uh, buy um, Starbucks. Um, you like a lot of companies left. Then there, it's very difficult to fly to Russia. I'm actually going there in a couple of weeks, so this journey is going to be through Hel Helsinki for me. There are three ways to get there. One is from Dubai through Dubai, but that's a very long route. It's like going kind of back and forth. And then another one is through Turkey. And since my family is in St. Petersburg, Helsinki is right there in the border. It's only like two hours away. So that's what I'm going to be doing. But ultimately, it's not affecting regular people. Uh, maybe a little bit less restrictions with travel, a little bit less opportunity. But also, it opens up uh, new doors for uh, for businesses. So when, when I went there in January, I noticed how many more brands there are there. So now all this opportunity exists for people to jump in um, and create something of their own. And it's actually a unique, unique space right now it's to, to build something. So it's, it's very interesting when it happened and you go through a mall and there are just empty spaces. But um, it's, it's refilling quickly with, with, other, with other ideas and products. And have you ever experienced any sort of prejudice, especially over the last year or so? I mean, have you experienced anybody maybe treating you different or because they hear your accent or they know you're from Russia? Have you experienced no. any of that at all? No, no, no. I'm proud to be Russian. It's, uh, I don't think, um, I don't think people really mix the politics and people. I've, I've never experienced, maybe somebody else has. But I, I, I'm always uh, ready to say that I'm from Russia. And I've had curiosity. People, people ask how my family is. Nobody really said anything bad to me. I've never heard anything like that. That's good. That's good. And, and uh, as far as like the process of you getting here, was it a long process? Was it easy to get a visa and green card and those type of things? Like, how did you make that happen? You know, um, I think immigration in general is always uh, a huge process. It's always, it's never easy. Uh, first of all, you have to learn a language. Uh, you have to adapt to new culture. You have to learn how to be without the support of your family. Uh, I mean, obviously they're supportive, but there is... It's not like I can go for lunch with my parents or maybe go for manicure with my mother on the weekend and complain about how difficult it is to move. But back then, before all of this um, 
before I guess the war started and before other events, it was a little bit easier. I think to me, I, I don't remember like a huge struggle, um, but uh, it's never easy. So try try moving to Europe or maybe not Europe, but maybe to Russia. And that's 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 probably exactly what's going to feel like for me to, to move to the United States. And so uh, did, well, like, how long did it take for you to get your visa back then? And how long did it take to get your green card so you could start working? How, what was that like? Well, when, when you move, you apply for all the documents and they allow, they give you, I, I can't remember, it was like 20 years ago, but I'll, as far as I remember, they almost immediately within a couple of months send you a document to travel. So technically you can leave the country and come back since you have a legal status, and then they give you uh, work authorization, which means you can have your social security number and you can start paying taxes. <laughs> so they don't wait too long on that part. <laughs> so, but uh, gradually you have to uh, get a green card and that's when you have your, your freedom, pretty much you're, you're there. But since I've been here for, uh, you know, 20 years, I, I do have my, um, my passport by now. So it is a process. It is a process. It's just not very like for me, it, it was for me, the most difficult part was adapting and learning how to to be successful, to be to 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 pave my way in the new country. So so how did you adapt? I mean, how what was that like for you in kind of, you know, but also maintaining some of those Russian roots and you know, not completely forgetting about where you came from, but then also adapting to the American way of life. That's one question. And then the other question is just, what are some of the differences between a Russian culture and a an American culture? So I was lucky enough in the very beginning, I made mostly American friends. So it was an easier transition for me because I, I spoke English most of the time. And if I didn't know how to, I had to use a, a dictionary. I remember first time I came to the United States, things like uh, different and difficult, those two words sounded so similar to me. So every time in a conversation, if I have to use one of those words, I have to stop and like, which one is it? Which one is it? And then choose the right option. Uh, so the language, um, was uh, came better with a lot of communication and I kind of wanted to distance myself from from my roots um I just recently remembered that after I moved I didn't go back to Russia for nine years wow actually we had this conversation with my mother and they, they would come visit me and we would go places together like in Europe or you know somewhere else but I had this um understanding that well i've been to russia there are so many other countries you can visit why go back and then at some point i went back and i remembered how wonderful it is and now i go like two three four times a year as, as much as i can like right now i'm flying for for a week i can't find more time for russia but at least at least something and, and what do you do so when you when you go to russia i mean what's what's some of the fun things if i was going to go to russia what are some of the maybe say top three things that I have to do for sure? Well, I think Russia is just as big as the United States and there is so much, so much. So whatever your interests are, in general, the way Russia changed is there is much better customer service. There are much better restaurants. There are much better, much, there's much better food. Um, art has always been there. Architecture has always been there. Theaters, ballet. So whatever you want to do, if, if you're into nature, you can find some beautiful spots. Like I always wanted to go to Kamchatka. It's very unique. It's beautiful. It's very far right now. It's it's not feasible for the next few years until they open the borders again for everybody. So it's like easier to fly instead of doing a 40 hour flight. You can just fly direct. Um, there is a lot to do, but in general, Russia is a lot of fun. I I, I was invited um, uh, to a birthday party. Um, it's going to be 
in Moscow uh, at a Greek restaurant. And she, she said, we're all white. So <laughs> she shows me this restaurant and everybody's breaking plates, you know, like uh, the Greek tradition. <laughs> Never been to Greece, but looks like we're going to have Greece in Moscow in a little bit here in November. How much fun is that? That's great. That's great. And so, so now kind of transition a little bit. Uh, I want to talk to you. I mean, you are in the, you're in the, the, the health business, you're in the beauty business. And uh, I want to know, uh, how did you get started? Like when you, you know, what did you do when you first arrived in America and how did you transition over to being in the business that you're in and what type of certifications do you have to have? And tell me a little bit about that. So when I arrived, I worked a little bit as a model, only a little bit, tiny little bit. And then I uh, worked um, at, a, at a spa in Las Vegas. Um, so for me, those jobs were very helpful to get used to the language. I was very scared to take the phone. Uh, whenever the phone would ring, I, I didn't know how would I understand what, what the person on the other end of the line would say. But uh, as soon as I adapted a little bit better, I went to nursing school and I worked in emergency room in Las Vegas for five years. And that was a very exciting career. Uh, yeah, straight of the straight of the nursing school. And then um, I, um, I've always struggled with acne prone skin. To me, uh, solving this conundrum was like a mission that I was on. And um, once I solved it for myself, I kind of uh, got interested in the whole aesthetic medicine because uh, when you deal with lasers and peels mm -hmm. and all kinds of microneedling treatments, inevitably you're gonna be exposed to other aesthetic treatments that you know, maybe erase wrinkles, maybe enhance some other aspects of appearance. So I was lucky enough to uh, to be introduced to this. And um, after five years, I, uh, I, I switched to, to, to aesthetics. And so obviously you being in the business, you know that there is a little bit of a debate uh, when it comes to aesthetics and, you know, just that type of medicine, that type of treatment, what are your thoughts about that in, you know, what are the health implications long range to doing, um, you know, that, that kind of, uh, you know, beauty work? So my philosophy on that is you have to be very careful not to go too far with it. So to me, overdone anything is, is against my beliefs, against my philosophy. So I believe that aesthetic medicine should only help to enhance beauty a little bit. It should boost your confidence a little bit, maybe help you age a little bit more gracefully, but it shouldn't be changing your whole you know, appearance, your whole face. Maybe... Um, Certain things people want to do, and I understand, but I'm not a surgeon. I don't offer rhinoplasty. I can only maybe lift up the tip of the nose a little bit, maybe make lips a little bigger. But I think it boosts girls' confidence, and I have a lot of male clients too. And aesthetic medicine can be, can be different things. Like, for example, tension headache, right? We know we can treat it with Botox. There is, uh, if, if you have masseter, uh, like if you clench your teeth too much and you have this muscle that's too strong, sometimes that can also call, uh, cause headache. So it spreads into more useful functional kind of medicine plus, um, you know, a little bit of aesthetics, like how you, you appear. But ultimately it's up to every person how they want to look. Um, uh, everybody can decide their style, their hair color, what color nails they're going to have, you know? So uh, the wrinkles and the way your teeth and smile look, it's, it's up to everybody, you know, like each, each person, each individual. Yeah, I, I think, so, you know, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying that it's, it's, um, it's, it's nice to have it there, 
uh, but whether you want it or not, it, you, you can always decide. It's nice to have options. For sure, for sure. And, and I mean, how, how do you handle though? There, you know, obviously there's haters, there's criticizers, there's people that say, oh, you know, people are going way too far. They're, I mean, you know, some, some of these women look like they, just a big piece of plastic, you know, and they don't even, almost don't even look real, some of these women. And how do you, uh, you know, how do you deal with some of that, you know, those people criticizing or hating on, uh, you know, doing stuff like that? I think part of my job is dealing with body dysmorphia. There are a lot of, um, you know, um, I want to say it's mental health. It's when you're uncomfortable with the way your life goes, when you're uncomfortable with the way you you're, you look. Maybe some people went through bullying. Maybe they weren't accepted by their parents. So all of that percolates to the desire like to, to change yourself. So you kind of have to be a therapist in my position to uh, highlight the beauty in people. Because I believe that people are beautiful in general. And when somebody comes to me and they say, oh, I have this wrinkle and I have that wrinkle. And some of the most beautiful girls call themselves names. I have models that are absolutely impeccable. They're like Barbie dolls in real life. And then they sit down in my chair and then and they um, use bad words towards themselves. Like, I'm ugly. I am horrible. This is disgusting. And I have to stop them. I have to say, I cannot do anything for you unless you change this perception on the inside. So you have to look how beautiful your eyes are, how blue they are, how long your hair is, uh, you know, your, your body is healthy. Like, be grateful for everything. And if you want to change a little wrinkle here and there, it's okay. But um, it has to come first with the general acceptance and self-love. And uh, th that's the healthy approach to it. And when we don't deal with it, with the body dysmorphia, and people come in and they want more lips, more this, more cheeks, more this, more that, um, that's when we get very unnatural results. And that's when the aesthetic medicine gets bad rap. Yeah, because I mean, I'm I'm scared of Botox and stuff like that, you know. So tell me about the misconceptions about Botox. I mean, it looks like it hurts. I mean, first of all, you know, somebody sticking a needle in my head. I mean, I I just it scares me, you know. It, so tell me about uh, you know, some of the misconceptions that you've heard and and maybe clear some of that up for me. Okay, let's dispel some myths about Botox. Uh, first, it's painful. Uh, this is first myth. I feel like if it's done right, it's not painful. It's more like a little bit of discomfort that anybody can can handle. And for the amount of benefit you get from it, uh, two minutes of little poking is is nothing. It's it's definitely not painful. And also, um, I think it may be painful first time if you really hype yourself up and you worried about it. Um, second myth is probably uh, that Botox is only for women. A lot of men don't really seek out those kind of treatments unless their wife, their girlfriend, their sister sometimes, uh, or like friend brings mm -hmm. them into the office. They do it one time, they get it done once. And then once they realize what it is, they make their own appointment. <laughs> and Botox can be done for a lot of things, um, like uh, uh, there is um, Botox for erectile dysfunction that's very popular right now. Wait, 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 so, what? Wait, 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 say that again? I've never heard of that. What <laughs> What are you talking about? What, what is, so, is, is it? So it pretty much relaxes. Uh, it it in, uh, improves the blood flow. Wait, but but uh, so you're so, saying you're going to take a needle down there? 
And you're gonna. I didn't say that. I didn't say okay. that. Okay. Right. So would where to, you would have to look for a provider that offers that. Okay. I don't offer it right now. So okay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. That. But but that but that's but but they do that though. You're saying they do that some at different places. They'll actually stick the needle down there, and that will help with dysfunction. With the size, yes. With the size and and the erection. <laughs> yes. I There's a lot no. of. Uh, See, see, see how how beneficial it can be. Not only headache, not only tension in your jawline, but ED is one of the other indications for Botox. It's very versatile drug, very versatile wow. product. That so can what be is in a it lot though? Of, a lot of what what is Botox? Like what's inside of this? What is it? So it's a purified protein. Uh, the molecule for each brand is the same. It's a tiny little molecule that. Uh, pretty much um, stops the signal from your brain into the muscle. So when you want to frown, when to, when you want to contract certain muscle, your brain has to send the signal to the muscle, right? But it stops the receptor for acetylcholine that delivers that message. So that messenger is lost in the process. So for three years or for three months uh, after the procedure, you cannot contract certain muscle. Uh, what happens on your face? Just because the skin lies right on top of the muscle, if you don't contract the muscle all the time, the skin starts to heal itself and build collagen in the wrinkles. So that's the mechanism of action. So it's it's actually preventative. If you uh, stop the, the muscle movement for a little bit here and there, you, your wrinkles don't get as deep. So it's it's great as a preventative measure. And what are the what are some of the other things that you do in your practice? In my in my practice, well, a lot of things. It really depends on what people need. Um, I uh, have fillers, dermal fillers, something that fills the volume deficit. So, for example, there is like a, a divot somewhere in the face, or you know, like maybe not enough volume in the lips, and that's where the the filler come comes in. Then there is thread. Thread is a suture, pretty much, that uh, surgeons use for their procedures. But if you make it thicker and uh, add hooks to the suture, it's actually a great lifting device. So you insert that thread into the face and lift everything up. And it kind of works like, I don't want to say mini surgery because nothing works as, as surgery. It's gold standard, but you know, it's just lifts the tissue uh, reposition. It's higher. And uh, there's microneedling, there is peels, uh, there is uh, PRP. PRP is also beneficial in so many ways. That's when you take the blood out of the, the vein, spin it and use the platelet rich plasma for multiple purposes. And so you're using your own plasma to uh, to exactly put exactly. it wherever it's you need very, to put it. Exactly, it's it's rich in growth factor, so it stimulates everything. And where where would people put it? I mean, like <laughs> you take out your own plasma. I mean, so let's just yes. say we take out my own plasma. So, like, what so what would be a place that I would want to put it? So it's for skin health. First of all, it's the most okay. common, uh, but. Uh, since we talk about ED, it can be uh, used for erectile dysfunction too, okay. or joints. You know, the it, some some doctors use it for joints. I don't do anything like that. Uh, I only stay like face up, but um, it's it's an option for joint pain. All right. Well, you do a lot. You got a lot of stuff happening. A lot of uh... very very fun field. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so is every day like different. I mean, you're seeing people uh, all the time and just do you have any funny stories, any crazy things that people have asked you to do before that you're like, I don't know if I can do that or anything crazy happen in all these years? Um, Nothing really crazy. I am. Um, I'm very um, I, I think I'm very good with my consultation skills. Uh, I've had to hone that uh, skill uh, over the years that I practice. I've been practicing for almost 10 years. Uh, but uh, it's very important to understand where the person is going with their goals. And my job is to listen carefully, explain what's possible, 
what's beneficial, what are the cons and pros. And then together we come up to some sort of treatment plan that satisfies my patients, first of all, and then helps uh, me achieve the beautiful result. So I don't all think right. I had any crazy stories. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, I mean, one. well, no, I mean, I'm sure most, uh, I'm sure the majority of people, they come in, they want, you know, bigger lips, they want Botox, you know, get rid of wrinkles. I mean, that's probably 80, 90%, would you say? Yeah, majority is usually something very, um, very simple. Um, but again, it depends on the patient's age. It depends on the season. Right now, we're in the fall. Everybody wants to get rid of that uh, hyperpigmentation from summer. All of those people that didn't apply sunscreen, <laughs> they're suffering right now. So we're working on that. Um, yeah, it really depends on, on a lot of factors. All right. So I'm in financial services, as you know, and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people want to know because there are people right now, they're like, man, I'd, li I'd love to go into that kind of business. I mean, yeah. what kind of money can you make? Is there good money in this business that you're in? I mean, what kind of money, what kind of freedom, what kind of life could somebody have if they did your kind of work? I think, I think I'm very lucky to uh, run a small boutique practice, uh, only work maybe, you know, three days a week and be able to find balance with the rest of my life, with, with my traveling, with my uh, hobbies, with my community, with uh, my friends. So it's, it's a wonderful field, but I, I want to say that it's very important to have passion before you go into any field. Um, a lucrative career should never be the number one goal to get into some, some, some business. Um, because as we all know, you can be a very highly paid teacher. You can pretty much any field. You take any field and you can make a lot of money if you right. are right. expert. So I think um, it's, if you're not a medical profession, professional and you just want to um, open a med spa as an investment, it's a very, um, it's very difficult. I think there are a lot of um, things you may not know uh, that would get you out of business pretty quickly. What, what are some of the downfalls of just say, I just want to go open up a spa and then just hire a bunch of people. I mean, this is what, what are some of the, the cons against doing something like that? You know, for me, I was very lucky because I found my niche early on. So when people ask me, are you worried about competition? I don't, I, I never worry uh, about competition. So um, it's, it's important to either create such a business plan and such a structure where you are very unique in the space because there is so much competition. Uh, and I'm lucky to say that I have a lot of people driving from San Diego to see me, from San Francisco. I have a group of patients flying from Miami, from Texas. Um, so it's, it's easier for them to hop on the plane or like drive two hours each way and to get things done right then go to their local injector next door and then come back and redo things. I mean, so, what, 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 what sort of challenges have you seen? Cause people will go maybe somewhere else, they'll get all screwed up and then they come to you, fix me. What, what are some of those things that you've saw? So the biggest, I, I'm used to redoing things, especially with lips. I use very specific uh, technique. It's called Russian lips. What it does, it gives you a little bit more definition and more natural appearance. Uh, and um, the volume stays in the lips, not behind it, not outside, not in the mustache area. So um, if you do lips somewhere, not, not you personally, but if the person does it somewhere with the conventional technique, then I have to wipe everything out and I'm used to it. And then we have to start the process again a, a week after the enzyme. Uh, but my challenge is that right now there are a lot of injectors that are coming from other countries that are not certified to inject. So they are not medical professionals. They are 
Um, maybe there are doctors in you know other countries, but here they don't have the license. So they will rent a place and they will use products that are not official. So I had a few patients that would come in and they say, I'm sorry, I went somewhere else. Like my friend went, I went with her and this is what happened. Let's dissolve everything. Let's start from, from scratch. And we try to dissolve it and it doesn't go away. So um, a lot of those products has um, silicone as a component, as an ingredient. And then the only way to take it out is surgery. So um, that's been challenging. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see uh, that certain things like mistakes like this can lead to such long-term consequences. Um, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I'm, 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 used to, I'm used to redoing other people's work unless it's done in such a way where I cannot redo it. You're, you're a skydiver? Is that right? You, you like went skydiving? Any, any cool places, any cool experiences that you've had in your life? Because the, the, the neat thing about you is you're pretty disciplined in the sense that you work hard, but you also play hard. I noticed that. And you've had a lot of experiences around the world. You take great trips. You, you know, I mean, is there, are, are you just, you know, disciplined with your money or, you know, like, how do you, how do you accomplish that? Because a lot of people, they can't go to Russia four times a year, you know? So how do you do that? Do you have somebody that manages your money? Do you manage your money on your own? How, how do you stay so disciplined? Um, so I do like to travel. I only travel when I can afford it. I, I don't, uh, you know, <laughs> rack up credit cards or anything like that. I do have a company that helps me with investments because I realized that, and it's Morgan Stanley, I realized that um, when I opened my E-Trade account, uh, certain positions, like certain um, stocks that I bought, they disappeared, only S&P 500 <laughs> stayed. So I decided to just leave it to the professionals who monitor the market daily, who have been doing this job for many, many years. Um, and uh, free my headspace for something else rather than investments. Um, but um, when it comes to traveling, I do like extreme things. And it doesn't have to be skydiving. I've only done it twice in my life, uh, both tandem. And the first time was such a scary experience. I thought I'd never do it again. And of course, I did it um, the second time. And the second time, I was able to not be scared. So somehow I got into this meditative state. I was observing the mountains and the lake and it, um, it, it was beautiful. So I, and, I decided not to get certified. I actually wanted to get certified in that. But then I realized that I overcame this fear. Maybe I, I'm, I'm ready for another challenge. So what's your next so, challenge? What are you going to do next? What, what's the next on the bucket I, list? I, I just recently picked up kite surfing. Wow. And a okay. um, couple of weeks ago, I came back from Brazil. We went to the north of Brazil and the wind there is so incredible. I've tried it uh, a couple of times before. And this time I finally felt like I'm comfortable. I mean, I'm not doing jumps with it, but you know, I can go upwind, downwind. I can do whatever I want. And uh, finally I am. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the process without. Is it, is it hard? Boring. Is it hard to do? Um, I don't think so. Um, a lot of people think it's very physical. It's not. Um, you are attached by a harness. I mean, obviously, the amount of wind is, is going to be determined by your body size and your weight. For example, I met this guy who is a pro kiter. And we were talking about the, the wind and he's like, oh, there is the wind here is only 36 knots. And to me, this is the highest I've seen. <laughs> to me, 36 is pretty, pretty good. This is like where my limit is. If, if I go to 37, I probably will lift off and fly away. But to him, it's actually pretty low because he's from South Africa and he is used to 46 knots. Um, obviously I wouldn't be able to, to kite in that kind of, um, you know, wind, strong wind, you need a little bit more muscle, a little bit more weight. How is your, uh, 
you know, I mean, obviously people would say you're a beautiful woman and you're on social media and you post a lot of beautiful pictures and your life and your travel and things like that. I mean, how has that impacted your business? I'm actually pretty secretive on social media. I, most of the time I, I don't post, <laughs> I can go for a whole trip and not post one picture. Like, uh, for example, from Brazil, there was only a couple of stories and that's how nobody knows where I've been, what happened. Um, yeah, I don't post a lot on social media. Um, not because I'm afraid it's going to affect my career. I want to be honest and vulnerable. I want to, I want to live my life and be a, not only a medical professional, but also, also a human, a person who has hobbies, who has, you know, travel experiences and, you know, new challenges, but, um, Personal social media is not as important to me. I know it's a great platform. I know everybody needs to put a little bit of effort into build, building it. I'm looking back and I'm kind of don't think current state of events, like my, my page represent me as a person. So maybe it's time to wipe everything out and start from scratch. Um, but, you know, I, I, I haven't put too much thought into social media. I mean, do you think that, you get bit like do you get business from social media at all i mean does it help you in that aspect or does it give you any sort of credibility online when people look you up because obviously now obviously you wouldn't know this necessarily but you realize that when somebody wants to come to your business one of the first things that they're going to do is they're going to look you up and they're going to look on your social media they're going to check you out they're going to say all right who who is this person what what do they do you know, do they have, uh, you know, have they posted about their business? Who do they have clients or, you know, do they have any testimonials or anybody that, that has trusted them? I mean, you, you get that though, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I've been very lucky that I've, I was able to, um, build a successful business with almost zero marketing. <laughs> I'm kind of scared to market at this point because then I won't be able to travel. All I have to do is work or maybe hire other people like me to, to work for me. But, so this um, is, this is really what it comes down to. I mean, let's be honest, right? I mean, you, you're in your mind, you're thinking if I, if I really market and if I go on social media and I really share what I know and give tons of value and really light it up, you're going to get more business than you want. This is what it is. This is what is going on in your mind is that you're thinking, I'm going to explode. My business is going to explode and I'm going to have too much business. Um, yeah. Um, my business is like a boutique practice and most of it is word of mouth. So one person yeah, comes yeah. and brings 10 more. And this is how I, I stay in business. I do market a little bit, very little. I probably should pay a little bit more attention to it because you're right. Some people do rely on uh, social media and, you know, your, your presence online. Uh, maybe I will pay more attention to it in the future. Right now, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, and you'll never know it, right? I mean, you'll never know those people that don't use you or use you because of your social media. I mean, somebody might see you just on a post and then they look at your social media and they go, oh, wow, she's got all this stuff and this, this is great. She's, you know, and, and I think in a visual world that we're in, there's no question when somebody looks at your social media and they, they, they find you attractive. I mean, not, not necessarily just exactly how you look, but they find you attractive in your, um, in your lifestyle. They find attractive, they find, maybe just um, the people that you've worked on attractive. And there's so many ways to kind of break it down. I mean, these, these people, if they don't think that you're attractive or they don't think that you could offer them value like they want and, or they don't just, they feel like maybe you're not a nice person online or you're not teaching things or you're not whatever, they could just not use you. Now you'll never know that they don't use you because there's no way of, of knowing that. But, uh, but I think anybody that's watching right now that is watching or listening right now, um, you know, there, there's no question if you want more business, it sounds like you have enough business for yourself right now. That's why you're not using social media so much. But if there's somebody out there that goes, that, that's saying, all right, 
I need more business. I want more business. Social media might be a good place to start building a brand, building a foundation of your business, and then creating lots of value, lots of um, you know information that you can share with your audience. Uh, so exactly. if you're ever looking for new business, that might be a place to 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 you know a direction that you go in, right? I I recommend social media for all new businesses. Uh, because that's that's the platform where uh, people most of the time go, and um, even if people use Google to to find a business, they will still be linked to social media. Whether it's a you know Instagram, some some sort of reporting. Um, I do have some um, clients that come from TikTok and Instagram. I mean, I'm doing a little bit more of Instagram right now. I'm kind of focusing a little bit more on it. But um, it's funny how I have TikTok account from, I don't know, three years ago. And I have literally five or six videos there. And every week I get clients from it. And I always ask, how? How did you find that video from three years ago? I didn't log in for three years. <laughs> how did you find me? So definitely, if you would like to start a business in the aesthetic um, industry or any other industry, I think social media is a a great tool to um, be seen and to to move forward. All right. If you weren't in your business, what business would you be in? Oh, wow, good question. I don't know. I think my business kind of fulfills my purpose and makes me happy. So I feel like I'm beneficial to people in a way that I can boost their confidence, I can help them look prettier, look younger. So to me, it's very rewarding. I have people crying in my office. They say, oh, why didn't I come to you earlier? They ask me to, can, can I give you a hug, please? So to me, this is very rewarding. I get a lot of text messages. Thank you so much. This is what it looks like. Get a lot of selfies from people. So unless I would get the same amount of you know, gratification from what I do. I don't know, probably I would stay in my business. <laughs> that's awesome. No, that's a great answer. Cause I mean, you know, it's, it's where you want to be. I think we all, I think you become successful at anything. If you uh, have passion for what you're doing. I mean, I, I, I feel just like you, I feel very grateful that at 21 years old, I went into financial services. I built a financial services company. We have 55 locations, 1500 agents. I, I feel grateful and lucky that I found it at 21, but I also feel grateful and lucky because I actually went all in, you know, and I actually did it. You know, most people, they sit around and they go, well, I wish I had this, or I wish I had that, or I wish this happened for me uh, instead of just doing it. You know, I always tell people do it now, right? I mean, I mean, there were when you when you came over to the United States, you didn't just sit around and just hang out. You actually did something. You went and got your nursing degree, and then you went to Las Vegas and you started working in an ER, uh, you know, in in the ER. So you you went and you did something, and then eventually you had to get your licenses or certifications to do what you do now. I mean, you went and you did it. You just made it happen. Mm -hmm. And you just had that feeling of, okay, uh, you know, this is my life and I'm not going to sit around and waste it. I'm not going to sit around and hope great things happen to me, but I'm actually going to go create it and not stop until I get whatever result I want out of whatever I'm doing. I'm just not going to stop until I get the job done. I mean, is this a little bit about your mindset and, 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 and what advice would you give maybe somebody that just came to America, um, what advice would you give them? I think I, I completely agree with you. Wishful thinking can only get you so far. You have to get up and you have to create a plan by, based on your wishes and um, step by step move a little closer to it. Uh, but I also have to tell you that I... I do engage in this wishful thinking. So I recently found um, a copy book from, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. And uh, I made a list of things I was wishing for. And it's so nice to see that almost everything came true. 
almost everything. So you do have to sit down and set goals for yourself and think where you want to be in five years and 10 years. Some of them may feel like too far out. And when you get there, you look back and you think, well, actually, I went a little bit a little bit further than my wish that didn't seem so realistic at the time. Um, but um, I think my advice for new immigrants is to, you know, not to be scared to, to fail. I think it's number one thing. And when you, failure is just uh, a part of the process, a, pro, a part of the road to, to success. So you fail fast, you get up, uh, you, you put your hair in a ponytail and you keep going. Um, I think um, just, just learn from the experience and keep moving. Love it. Love it. Okay. Well, Vera, uh, thank you so much. I mean, for all of your time today, I, I really appreciate it. I know that my audience, they're going to be blowing your social media up. So at least for this, you know, when this comes out, make sure you check your DMs. Okay. Cause you're going to get a lot of messages. A lot of people are going to say, thank you so much, Vera, for, uh, you know, uh, giving us all that information. We love your story. People are going to be calling you up for business. You might get too much business, uh, but, <laughs> but, but just, um, you know, I'm asking everybody that's watching or listening, no matter what, whether you, you know, work with her or you don't, uh, do me a favor, at least just DM her and just say thank you so much for her time, for her energy, for her you know, optimism um, for her great story, and especially, you know, when, when it comes down to an immigrant, you know, that, that came here 21 years old with probably not a whole lot and to turn her life into a life where she's living life on her terms. She gets to do what she wants to do whenever she wants to do it. She's built a business. She has a clientele. She has a following. She's been very, very successful. And now she gets to travel the world. Now she gets to live her wealth on the beach. And, uh, and that's pretty cool to, to see somebody do that and very inspiring for the rest of us to watch it. And, uh, and a lot of people, they want to be a part of that. So again, reach out, tell her, you know, thank you so much. And, and, uh, and, and then, you know, connect some way, somehow connect and let's support each other on this channel on Alonzo Academy and wealth on the beach club and wealth on the beach podcast. Let's support each other. Let's help each other. Let's lift each other up. And, uh, you know, and as always, you know, just continue to just dream bigger, like, like just let it rip, man. Let it go. Just everything you wanted, write it down, build a plan, have a dream video, do what you need to do to become the best version of you that you could possibly become. You got to get after it though, right? You, you, you could dream bigger, but you got to get after it. And most importantly, you need to do it now. God bless you. We will see you at the top.